The Rosinante returned from Illus in bad shape, and Fred Johnson's people at Tycho say it's going to be 28 weeks before it's going to be ready. That's going to be a lot of downtime. You can see why this is an ideal time for the others to deal with their various issues, which includes Naomi, but we'll get into her next time. Fred takes Holden aside to talk through all that's happened, and they get into a bit of an analogy about the settlement of the American West, covered wagons and Indians, or rather in their case, the lack thereof. What exactly happened to them all? It's a rather frightening thought when they think about the magic bullet that Miller dealt with on Illus. Now, the theme of Nemesis Games has been confronting the past for each of the individuals, and while none of this seems like anything Holden has to confront, it's actually important because that's merely preamble. That's only the backstory to the real past we have to deal with, which is... James Holden, self-appointed do-gooder of the solar system. Holden has to contend with the fact that his actions have made him, for good and for ill, into a celebrity. That's the past he has to deal with. Since we're talking about the American past and talking about celebrity, let's bring those two together with a common subject, baseball. In 1983, Bill James was pushing ideas about examining baseball statistics, and it was during this that he coined the Law of Competitive Balance. Now, it has three points to it, but we're just going to cover the first for right now. It's, every form of strength covers one weakness and creates another, and therefore every form of strength is also a form of weakness, and every weakness a strength. He says that, for instance, being physically attractive in one's youth is a strength in that it opens up a lot of options for you. But it's also a weakness because that makes the negative personality traits more likely to be endured because people will tolerate them from an attractive person. Hence, they don't stop learning that they need to not be a jerk. In Holden's case, celebrity opens up lots of doors for him. He could talk to the leader of the OPA or with high-ranking members of the Earth government with just one call. He can make a statement and people will hear it. He can take action based solely upon his reputation. But it also means that everywhere he goes, he's recognized. And every time he's recognized, he's not recognized as the man he is. He is recognized as the physical manifestation of the legend of James Holden. He is the guy that some drunk might pick a fight with to prove how tough they are. He's the guy that you might ask for a handout. He's the guy that you ask to pose with for pictures to show your own brush with celebrity. He's the guy that you hurl a cutting word at because of his connection to something that you don't like. Holden also is the guy that a journalist would go to in order to make progress on a major story, as in the case of Monica Stewart the woman who'd been on the Rosinante during the Slow Zone incident. Monica's here because there are ships missing that have tried going through the ring to the New Worlds. About 3%, a small-sounding number, perhaps, but when the UN Navy projects only a half percent for their losses, the statistical aberration is worrisome. Monica thinks that it has something to do with the proto-molecule, and she's come to hold it in the hopes that he can persuade Fred to use his sample of the protomolecule to try to summon Miller and get some answers. Holden knows that this is a non-starter, but he is concerned about the problem nevertheless. The current situation for the OPA is that the colony worlds are being perceived as the death knell for the culture of the belt because they can't live down a gravity well. They call the settlement a genocide. Given that some renegade belters tried to send a ship against Earth, an old ship admittedly, but nevertheless tried, Holden wonders if someone might have been desperate enough to start stealing colony ships. He speaks to Fred about it, saying his concern is that Monica's theory needs to be deflected before it gains traction and people start panicking over more alien weirdness. But the most likely explanation would be someone on Medina is involved, and Fred can't abide that thought. His entire future for the belt hinges on Medina putting him at the center of the future galactic government to make sure that Earth and Mars can't try to shut him out. If Fred's got a problem on Medina, helping the belt endure this is potentially doomed, so he asks Holden to 
kindly not destroy his life's work just because Holden is bored and lonely. Holden hires a programmer to start sifting all the information and trying to find new ships showing up that match old ones that disappeared, which is how he comes across a possible leak for Alex that he asks him to check out. But it's clear that Fred is a bigger problem than Holden suggested because Monica vanishes, kidnapped out of her quarters with someone on the inside covering the kidnapping up, meaning it's unlikely to be one of the inners being behind it. Monica is eventually recovered, but there's clearly a coup on Fred's hands, and soon a coordinated attack shuts down defenses while ships outside take action against Tycho Station. They're able to eventually capture the subversives, but the ships make off with the wall of Fred's office. That may sound trivial, but the wall contains the safe where the protomolecule sample is kept. When the dust settles, Sakai, the engineer that had been working on the Rosinante, is questioned and quickly spills his contempt for Fred and Holden and their patronizing attitudes that the belt needs Earthers to save them. Fred eventually decks the guy for acting as if Fred hadn't sacrificed everything for the belt, and shares with Holden that he got a message from Anderson Dawes about a militant splinter faction. Dawes is the man who recruited Fred into the OPA and is currently running series, and explains that he didn't sanction what they did or prove it, but that they live in difficult times, that the militant schism are nevertheless true patriots, and that Fred can still have a place at the table if he's willing to turn Sakai over to Dawes at Palace Station. Fred's concern not just with all of this, but the brazenness of it, and the fact that he's not sure who can even be trusted around here anymore. That brazenness, though, that ties back again to what I was referring to earlier, the competitive balance. We'll get back to that again in a moment. Monica agrees to help them with their investigation in return for an interview, and she shares info not just on her kidnapping, but also more details for the missing ships how it almost looks like the footage is doctored the way things are going out there. But during the interview, Monica starts asking some unfriendly questions, much to Holden's annoyance. But Fred points out it's because they've kept the info on the protomolecule from her, and she's not happy. So before Holden prepares to deliver Fred to Luna and the Rosinante, work has apparently accelerated to allow them to use it for what's coming up, Holden goes to sort things out with Monica. His celebrity again bites him when she throws in his face how the guy who built a reputation on openness is keeping secrets and being political, and not being subtle about it, calling him paternalistic and presumptive to keep people in the dark. Holden has finally had enough of all of this and lashes out at her that there are only two possibilities about Monica herself. Either what she does makes absolutely no difference, so her life's work is a joke, or it does make a difference, in which case she needs to start taking responsibility for how she uses and abuses her power before she causes a tragedy and pretends that it's not her fault. Before they can finish their argument, though, the message is relayed about the Rosinante from Naomi to fix the software for the magnetic bottle. It's rigged so that when the core reaches 95%, it will explode, which will take out not only the ship, but part of Tycho Station. They eventually are able to locate the problem and fix it, but in so doing, they note that this is proof that thousands of accidents throughout the years could have just been revealed to have been murders. And for one final worrying issue, Medina Station has gone dark, and the possibilities for that start with bad and go down from there. But Holden agrees that right now, the only thing that they can do to try to help with any of this is to follow their original plan go to Luna to meet with Avasarla and try to work through this. As Fred soon explains to Holden, using an example of Alexander the Great versus the Persians, the audaciousness of a military commander can sometimes take advantage of an opportunity and exploit it, and in fact continue to hold the enemy off balance until total victory is achieved. That might be what they're looking at here. He says, though, the one comforting thought is that there are a lot more people who have thought that they were Alexander the Great than actually were Alexander the Great. But nevertheless, this idea of audaciousness and the brazenness referred to earlier ties back into what I said about the law of competitive balance, about strengths and weaknesses. 
The other two points of that law are that the balances of strategies always favors the team which is behind and that psychology tends to pull the winners down and push the losers upwards. If your team is winning, you're going to stick with what you're doing. And if your team is losing, you're going to be innovating. You're going to change your players around. You may start trading away players or firing coaches or managers. You're going to search for any weakness in your own side to eliminate it and any strength on the other side that you can turn against them. The first of which is them sitting on their laurels. It's what allows the winners to keep a mediocre catcher because they're still winning or normally hungry salesmen to coast after a winning year because, hey, we had a winning year or victorious general to not shore up any weaknesses. The militants have seized upon this complacency to not just go after the belt, but to try to seize control of the entire solar system. And so, as Holden's forced to go out without Naomi, Alex, or Amos, Holden has found himself the captain of an entirely new team backing him up, and the hope that maybe they can help pull an upset before Marco Anaros wins it all.